What's cool about it was it was really this solution for insulation because, you know, we were doing passive house. That's like what we do. Um, and a passive house basically uses three times the amount of insulation. And when your insulation is all the wrong stuff, you're using three times of all the wrong stuff when it's has a high carbon footprint, when it's non-renewable, when it's non-recyclable, when it's in some cases toxic, when combusted foam, whatever. And so we're like, you know, we, we it was really about a solution for our buildings because while we're doing high performance, we weren't necessarily sustainable. Hello and welcome to Architecture, Design and Photography. Today we are speaking with Matt O'Malia of Opal Design Studio. I've known Matt for about 12 years as a client. I've had quite a few conversations with him just around design and architecture and everything else, but I'm really looking forward to picking Matt's brain about his business acumen drive, how he conducts all of that, because he's always struck me as someone who's been thinking 10 steps ahead constantly. And it's really neat to see someone who's got an intensely uh, high degree of design capability along with strong degree of business acumen. It's not very common. And uh, Matt's been very successful at that. I've always been impressed with his work and his, his business model and his forward thinking. So I'm very excited to get a lot of that out of his head today, hopefully. So uh, hopefully you enjoy the conversation. Please catch Matt's upcoming uh, article in Main Home Design, a design theory coming up in the next issue. And without further ado, Matt O'Malley. <laughs> Matt O'Malley, welcome to Architecture, Design and Photography. How are you doing? Doing great. How are you doing? Um, personally, selfishly loving this pandemic because it means that I can be an introvert and not have to socialize at all. So... It's a pretty selfish <laughs> viewpoint on it, I know, but there's always a silver lining, right? Uh, you know, you got to take what comes, right? Find the best. Yeah. Um, how's the pandemic been for you, you guys, for business? I keep hearing that all architects are just gangbusters right now. Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of demand. There's a lot of interesting kind of transformations in the market caused by you know, what's happened over the last year. And I think just the cultural shift is immense and people are taking a lot of action about what they've experienced. And I think from the profession of architecture, particularly, particularly the residential side, because, you know, when you look at the commercial side, there's a lot less interest in projects right now, just because of the uncertainty around larger buildings or institutions, that sort of thing. But when you look at the residential side, you know, it's just a really interesting conversation because the way I see it is we've been having these program discussions about how people want to live in their houses, you know, ever since I've been an architect. And it's been really consistent about what people are looking for. Two bedrooms, bath, you know, living, kitchen, whatever that is, you know, really quite, really quite stable over all these years. And then in the last, what, 12 months, all of a sudden the thought about how you're living in a space and what you need to live in a space when you're planning new is completely different because all of a sudden you're taking into consideration all of these things that you used to have distributed in your environment elsewhere, like the gym or how you're going to cook and the type of food storage you have. And I think the other really interesting one to me is like how you're going to relate to your natural environment, because I think people are a little shell shocked particularly the folks who were living in the cities over the pandemic about being confined in these small spaces and not having this access. And so now when they're thinking about, I'm going to move to Maine, I'm going to kind of transport my life. I know I can work here now because of zoom and other technologies, but when I'm here, I don't want to replicate what I had when I was in the city, which is like in this box, I want to be really engaged with nature. And I want the building and the built environment to really sort of open up, and connect with nature in an entirely different way than we've been asked to do, in a, you know, since we've been doing this. And I think that's what's interesting to me. It's not only the program shifted, but the relationships to site and nature and how you're living within these volumes and being having more access and more connection has all of a sudden become a really high priority. It's a bit of a shift away from a suburban model, if you will. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I didn't think of it that way. Now, you have a fairly unique perspective on this, I'd imagine, because I believe your wife's a doctor. Yes. Yeah, she's a physician. She uh, <laughs> she was in charge of the COVID clinic in our local small oh, town wow. here. So uh, she was uh, she's been very busy. I, you know, like one has heroes. Right. And she's definitely one of mine. Wow. Wow. So. The, for this conversation especially, yeah, I didn't really think of that ahead of time, that you have this perspective of what's going on with 
health crisis and everything else in the real world, but also the uh, the the effects that that sink into our lives and the actual way that we live and how that's impacting uh, residential design. I didn't think about that as much as well. I was just constantly thinking about, oh, I, we need a home office now. We need more of a home office. But yeah, right. the gym's not available. Uh, socializing in it isn't as much available. Going out just outside and doing stuff if you're from New York City was not available. But now that you're, if someone's here, it's, it's a totally different story. And that, uh, to me, that, that's a really interesting thing where we went from uh, like the kitchen being a totally separate building from the house to mm-hmm. being in the house, but being visually separated. And then our lives over 100 years over the last century have transferred to this thing where we have kitchen in full view of dining room because you want to be able to socialize as you cook. And that's now distributed more in a much more egalitarian way between husband and wife, husband, and husband, wife, wife, whatever, um, to where now the, the design is, you know, kitchen, dining, living room, just all in the same room. That's, that's how my house is. Cause you know, I've seen it that way and I, I like, liked it and I've liked it in practice and living that way. It took us a hundred years to really, you know, roughly do that. Now in one year, we're, we're doing this huge transfer of possibly, who knows, in another hundred years, we might not be building these huge buildings where people act like points of data coming to a server every day to interact and then leaving that and traveling another hour and a half home every day. That. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, and what I do think is interesting, though, is people really still want variety, though. Like, I oh, think yeah. that's where this whole thing hasn't worked really well. It's because when you're in your bedroom and you wake up and then you have your coffee in the kitchen, then you go back to your bedroom to work and you mm. spend your, you know, like that, I don't think is a healthy situation for anybody, no matter how nice your bedroom is. And so what kind of what we're seeing is, you know, you hear a lot about the ADU idea, which is really a question about density as well, isn't it? What you is know, it's not ADU? The, Oh, accessory dwelling unit, which is okay. in zoning this ability to have these sort of small structures added in addition to a primary dwelling unit. And I think what's interesting about that is it before the pandemic, it was um, a, a, a opportunity for density, you know, densifying these sort of suburban environments. Um, but with the pandemic, it's become this sort of ability to provide variety and movement in and around the site that you're living. And so to your, you know, to the point of like, we're all in the house. Now it's like, I'm not going to the office, but my office is a separate building. I'm having this sort of spatial, physical transition from where I'm living to this other space where I'm working. And I think what we're seeing in those program requests and the way of conceiving of how they want to live going forward is the recognition of I need a workspace and these this workspace has these criteria. A lot of time it's like my husband is a very loud zoomer and I need acoustical separation, you know, but it's also like I really got I really have to be out of the house for a bit and and have this kind of different mental space that I want to inhabit. The other interesting thing that you mentioned about um, the kind of kitchen living dining, I totally see that as the trend, the sort of public food preparation. I think it's a lot about gathering, not just about a meal that's like delivered, but created. Um, the other one that's really interesting is I'm, we get a lot of requests now for that configuration, but with a separate sort of what would be a study or a den or or like the separate intimate space. And there's like a wood stove in there, there's bookshelves, there is a TV. It's like intimate, it's more private. And it's in this interesting sort of break off of a variety, you know, kind of a different spatial condition opportunity where, you know, it's a living room per se, but it's become much more intimate, small and separate. And I, you know, we've been, we've had dens all along. There's nothing new there, but we've been getting a lot of requests for these dens and with very specific criteria about it that I think for me is interesting because it's, it's a different trend. You know, it's totally different that people are suddenly asking for these in that kind of traditional plan layout. Very, very interesting stuff. Hmm. When the, when the pandemic first started, what was, what was your, uh, you know, business emotional posture to like, oh my goodness, what's going to happen now? Last, last, you know, April looking at the whole thing, what, what was your thought at that point? compared to what you've now seen over the last year? Well, you know, what a great question. And I think having a year to, to work through it and digest it makes it, a little, you know, brings a little clarity to it. You know, for us on the architecture, so you have, I have two 
companies, right? And so I can't separate the two. So you got, I'm going to give you both. Um, one is the architecture firm. And with that, we had some several really important projects for us um, with institutional clients, universities, colleges, and that the uncertainty around gathering and, you, you know, public space and um, how we're going to be on campuses or not, given the pandemic, you know, that uncertainty absolutely put the brakes on a lot of those projects, just full stop. And so we were in development. We had a, we had a workflow based on a few of these large, important projects for us. Um, and <laughs> they went on hold pretty much right away. And yeah. that, that was, that was unnerving to say the least. It was a bit terrifying. Um, but at the same time, then there was all of a sudden this interest in like, how do you manage a socially distanced life and, you know, what cities versus, you know, kind of living in Maine and, you know, all these people kind of already making this exodus right away off the bat and started, you could see this trend developing about like, we want to live differently. We want to think about, we don't know how long this is going to go on and we're going to do things differently. So, you know, there's like an immediate replacement of this sort of residential piece kind of coming in behind that, which is, you know, for, for a firm, it's good, you know, obviously to have diversity. And I think with our team, we're like, look, we, our focus has to be on flexibility, diversity, and we have to be able to pivot and stay light and that sort of thing. Um, so that was the architecture side on the, the, another thing that I do is, um, we have a company, um, I'm a co-founder with jo uh, Josh Henry, who's a PhD chemist called Geo, uh, Go Lab. And the company itself is called Timber HB, which is a large startup, which we're going to be manufacturing wood fiber insulation here in Maine, in Madison, Maine. And the story, the story of that one goes is we've been working on this project for several years. Sort of and this is this is waste product that you're repurposing. Yeah, yeah, this correct? is exactly right. We're taking the residuals or the waste stream from a, the law of uh, this a law. <laughs> excuse me the lumber industry, sawmills, and yep. we're taking those residuals, which are wood chips basically, and we're grinding them up into fibers and we're creating this, these insulation products. So uh, there's three of them. There's a loose fill replacement for cellulose, a bat and a board product. So kind of a full suite of above ground insulation. And we had been developing this project since 2016. We bought the Madison Mill. We had bought this equipment in Germany that we we're sending over to Maine. And we had also raised a bunch of money and we were over in Germany um, in March, uh, around f the 15th, and we were finalizing a deal with a German partner over there who was going to do a big equity investment. And the day that we were supposed to have the meeting was the day after travel from Europe to U.S. was going to close. <laughs> oh, my word. So, we're, so we had to change our flights. We changed our meeting. You know, we had this meeting like the pandemic was literally erupting in our face particularly as you recall in italy at the time right oh um, yeah it was just a tremendous mess there and so we were kind of freaked out because we didn't want to get stuck in europe um, but we wanted to have finalized the deal with these partners so we did that left went back and the pandemic ensued obviously and that unfortunately that structure of that deal wasn't going to work out because those european partners couldn't come to the us anymore there's i mean there's no way for them to do the support role that they were going to play and everything else. So, you know, we had this, we had built this great project around this financial close in June with this partner and that just obviously the wheels fell off the bus on that. So, <laughs> so on the architecture side, we had to pivot, but on the, on this big startup, this manufacturing startup, we really had to pivot and, you know, we were raising money. That was how it was working, you know, to get through. And as you can imagine in a pandemic, you're just not going to raise any money. I mean, no one was investing in uncertainty. And so it really took all these months till actually, you know, come to the fall now, we've, we've kind of pivoted. We have a new investment structure using a bond um, that we're going to be closing in June, um, brought on a bunch of new investors and a chief marketing officer. And, you know, we've really, really done well, um, particularly lately this spring um, has really been going extremely well for us. But I tell you, when you asked me the question, like, what happened when this started? And like, well, there's two things that happened. One was on the architecture side, and we were able to pivot just fine. And the other was a really, really rough climb uh, with, uh, with this massive hungry startup that needed, you know, that needed to be fed and completed. So I've uh, learned a lot this last year, I guess you might say. 
Yeah, it's been a, been a bit of an active <laughs> year for you. Are are you underway in manufacturing? Are you are or are you back on track where you kind of left off last March? That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, you read it, it completely correctly. Yeah, we're really back where we started, and we'll be completing this um, bond and looks like June right now, which will allow us then to make all the equipment orders. We're, we've already started um, manu- or we started uh, construction at the mill in Madison, doing renovations and prep work, and then we'll just go into full equipment installation. But it's, you know, it's a very, it's a very big project. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the manufacturing equipment is like two football fields long. It's just everything's oh, wow. massive. So, you know, it, it takes a fair amount of time. Our goal is to be in production um, in end of 2022. So I think that's, that's pretty realistic for us. Well, so I, I did an introduction for this podcast, you know, before you were on, because it's just a little simpler, more time cost, time cost effective, whatever. And in that intro, I said, it's always interesting to talk to Matt because he's always thinking about 10 to 12 steps ahead. And it's just so <laughs> obvious in talking to you <laughs> that I, I would have just emotionally crumbled and crawled back into bed March 15th, if I were you, probably. I, there's certain people that are built to be able to take that stress and punishment and, and maneuver <laughs> and keep going. And there's that, that's really impressive and, and very uh, inspiring what you're doing as far as uh, you've got waste product in Maine that you're turning into a very uh, valuable and new, uh, you know, and ecologically sound uh, building product. And for yeah. those who are listening who don't know, the the wood fiber insulation from the, I think the one job that we had done with you, there's a, a really, um, a really, I don't know, for lack of a better word, a really dense, strong um, product that is kind of like a wall assembly, if you will, that kind of goes, to, goes together like huge, uh, Lego bricks in a way. And Mm -hmm. then, and these are all, uh, as you'd said earlier, an above ground application. The only downside of the wood insulation is it can't go in a moisture rich environment, like, like rock soil below the ground, but it's, it's, uh, completely, it's a carbon sink essentially. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really, it's really so cool. You know, that's, you know, you, (laughs) The getting into this project, you know, you, sometimes you just jump, right? Sometimes, you know, you, you get excited about something, you see this huge opportunity and you just go for it, right? And and that's what this was because, like you're saying, there's all these attributes which are positive to this product, but also bringing manufacturing back to Maine, creating 113 jobs in rural Maine, which has a 16x multiplier in uh, additional jobs, you know, in the industry around manufacturing, mm-hmm. you know, in the lumber and, and all of that and supply chain. And so, you know, for us, it was just such a great opportunity and an important opportunity for all of those reasons, not, not just from the building side, not from the socioeconomics, not from the lumber industry side, sustainability. It was like all of those things. And one of the great things about it is, which really was the initial driver was this carbon question, because Trees sequester carbon when they grow. The CO2 from the atmosphere turns into the wood itself. It's stored into that tree until it's harvested. The problem has been since 2016, we've lost all these paper mills. And that was a really good way to take this, the lumber and and convert it into usable product. Um, We lost six mills, you know, since 2016, which had, you know, like when you think of the math, it's $1.6 billion annually net economic decline for the state. You know, and it's just like we, we, you know, we're a modest state to begin with. Right. And so, yeah, there's there's a real need for new value add products in the forest industry. And we came along with this. And what's cool about it was it was really this solution for insulation because, you know, we were doing passive house. That's like what we do. Um, And a passive house basically uses three times the amount of insulation. And when your insulation is all the wrong stuff. You're using three times of all the wrong stuff when it's has a high carbon footprint, when it's non-renewable, when it's not recyclable, when it's in some cases toxic, when combusted foam, whatever. And so we're like, you know, we, we it was really about a solution for our buildings because while we're doing high performance, we weren't necessarily sustainable, right? Because the carbon payback for insulation is around seven to ten years. So you you install insulation because you're saving energy, saving carbon. But when that payback just for the carbon footprint of that material is seven to 10 years, 
you know, that's not very fast. It's not, it's not an expeditious solution to climate change. I can assure you that because your payback is too far in the future and it's compounding, right? So with this, you know, you, you take that carbon from the tree, it's put into a value add product and it comes to the job site carbon negative. And then the nice thing about it then is you look at the existing insulations, they're all carbon positive. They have a six to 10 year payback. We come to the job site carbon negative. So it's not just it has a low carbon footprint, we're actually offsetting, we're negative. And, and that's where I think, you know, when we're talking about solutions to climate change, I was always focused on operational carbon, you know, build efficient building, build efficient building, passive house, whatever. We got to look at material use, you know, we really got to look at the full life cycle of buildings. And that was the big change in my thinking and back in like 15, 16, where we got existentially freaked out about how we were building and made us do this ridiculously large project because no one else was, you know, and the rest is kind of history at this point. Hmm. Now, what I remember <clears throat> when I first started working with you guys on projects back when you were in the little tiny red house uh, as a spec <laughs> house, essentially, that was your office. And uh, I remember kind of uh, getting to know you. The first time I met you was doing actually this piece, a design theory piece, probably 15, 15 ish years ago. Something but then like that, yeah. I, I remember shooting your, um, the red house and seeing the level of attention to actually monitoring like electronically aspects of the building and how they performed the solar return, mm. the heat retention, all of that stuff. And also sitting next to one of the windows when it was 10 degrees outside and feeling no heat loss. And I was like, hmm, mm -hmm. this is really cool. But geez, these guys are like little like environmental nerds, just like, <laughs> and, but you're at the same time, usually if you have such a focus on one thing, your design usually suffers. And I didn't see that with you guys. You had really, really high end, thoughtful design combined with, you know, not over the top, but an affordable uh, solution for someone who wanted this kind of thing, good design and uh, ecologically sound, if that's the right way to say that. Um, and I remember talking to other people about it, other designers and you know heads of firms or whatever, and how focused you guys were on that. At, and at that time, it, it was not it was not the the thing. It it was mm. just just starting. And I remember other people thinking like, ah, oh, it's just gimmicky. It's not going to blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but I remember, I remember seeing your guys focus on that and then seeing how that focus would translate into more and more media attention for your firm completely outside of the state or wherever else. And now it's become this thing that everyone seemingly is playing catch up to the people that, you know, the firms that put that at the forefront, you know? And what was it for you that that long ago made you really realize this is a huge thing that we've got to pay attention to and marry into a high design aesthetic, not just be an architect that's solely concerned with aesthetic and functionality for the person experience, but incorporating this in extreme, you know, positively extreme, uh, environmental aspect and efficiency. Well, Trent, I really appreciate you saying that. Um, you know, and what I think is cool about this conversation for me is, you know, we collaborate, we've been collaborating with you for all these years. You've seen every little painful step that we've taken as we've tried to move, <laughs> move an idea forward. And, you know, to be, to be perfectly honest, so much of our success has been the reproduction of the concepts through the photographs that you've taken. I mean, so much of our success has been that full picture um, coming to Thank life, you, you know, and, and telling a story. And, I, and you know, obviously we still work together on all our projects and, and that to me is like one of our key ingredients for success. So, um, but that's just it. Like, you know, back in the day, it was just a strong desire to do something that was the right solution. You know, it had nothing more to do from a sort of a business standpoint than to take this idea of from my design background, you know, which from, from an architectural standpoint, I was really focused on design. You know, it was like my thing that I really engaged with, enjoyed. Um, and the work that I was doing pre prior to launching um, Geologic was, you know, doing high end residential and really sort of very detailed work. And I loved it. You know, that's, that's why I got into this profession to begin with is just that kind of 
just sort of joy of making beautiful things and the craft. But at some point I realized I was spending my time and energy and resources into these design challenges, which were really not going to change the world for the better. It, you know, it was an amenity. It was, it was a proper nice thing, but it wasn't going to make a positive change. And I called it the sock drawer effect. Like when you're spending your design energy on making a sock drawer or the like, you know, I, I, at some point I'm like, I, why, why am I working so hard? What is the benefit that I'm bringing? And, you know, at the same time, you know, we have three kids and they're extremely important to me and we're looking at the world around us. And this is, you know, 2007 or so, 2008. And, you know, there was, it was clear that climate change was a real deal. It was clear that our, um, our sort of ramp up and response to it societally was lacking, you know, to say the least. And I felt like, you know, really the key has to be that I, I shift and take what I love in design and translate that into design that has a sort of positive outcome, this sort of beneficial impact with buildings and really take on this challenge and, and channel that love of design into something that, that many, many people can engage with. And that was the impetus for the go home. The other thing at the time, like, let's not forget, it was like oil was $110 a barrel and people were Remember freezing that. to death in their homes in, homes in Maine. You know, it was just like totally unacceptable that we could be this modern country where people just couldn't even heat their buildings. And, and you know, existentially, the solution wasn't more oil or cheaper oil. The solution was not to use energy. Like that was obviously the obvious way forward. And so... We got into Passive House very early days, as you point out. It was definitely fringe. Um, you know, people, the funny thing is in, in the sustainability community, people were actually hostile towards it. Like there was like towards direct House. hostility towards Passive House because it was too extreme. It was too much. It was, you know, wackadoodle. It was, it didn't, you know, it wasn't relevant. You know, it's now it, it Passive just, House is a European based kind of standard, is it? Yeah, exactly. Passive House it comes from Europe and was developed by this guy, Wolfgang Feist, uh, Dr. Feist, brilliant, brilliant physicist who actually um, co collaborated with Harold Orr, who's a Canadian guy who actually built kind of the first prototype of Passive House in Canada. A lot of people get like, I don't, you know, German technology. I'm so sick of that. But I'm like, look, guys, it's Canadian. Everyone loves the Canadians. <laughs> Canadians that a German You're took an engineer. Like, <laughs> it's not offensive at all. Maple leaf, all that. Um, so... No, it's, it's a great standard. And that, that that's for us what was so important. While it hadn't really been done in the U.S., Katrin Klingenberg was starting in Illinois with the first one at that time. You know, it was like frontier land. There was, there was a number built in Europe, and the technology was developing pretty rapidly there at the time. Um, I have my education from a German university, so I speak German. I'm quite familiar with German products and practice have worked there. And so when, when we're looking at Passive House, we're like, you know, the Germans are very disciplined in these sort of models and methods. So it's like, it's, I, I'm not going to discount it out of hand of being extreme, even though I didn't understand it. Uh, it's not like it was extreme as to me. It's like, well, let's just build it and see what happens. We didn't know what the outcome would be. Um, and so we did certify the first Passive House in Maine. It was the 12th in the U.S., and so to your point, it was super early days for that technology. And Passive House, for your listeners who don't know, really in a nutshell recommends that a building use 90% less energy than conventional construction. Oh, wow. So, you know, kind of an extreme uh, leap forward. But for us, it was like, you know, let's give this thing a try. It's founded on logic. Let's translate that logic and, and see what it means for buildability in the U.S. And we were a design build company so we could really innovate and try new ideas and Something that happened on the, you know, the drawing board here could easily go back and forth with the site until we got it right and great feedback loops for innovation, which is important um, as it allowed us to really move our technology and understanding forward. And we imported our own windows and all these other materials. So we were always kind of like the lead at edge of innovation and demonstration on that. Um, but in the meantime, what I think is fantastic, really fantastic, actually, is that so many people are know about Passive House and are doing Passive House at scale. And, you know, when people, when you ask me like, you know, is change happening fast enough to combat climate change? Are we really moving along? You know, all this sort of thing. Well, back in 2008, the response that we got in the marketplace and how low the expectations of the marketplace for energy performance sustainability were 
to today is like you can't even imagine. I'm like, there's so much change that's happened. There's so much awareness. Millions and millions of square feet of passive houses are being built every year. Granted, it's a small sector of the total, but it's an exponential adoption curve. And that is how, you know, rapid change occurs. And so people can get quite pessimistic about, you know, we're not moving at a pace that's fast enough. Okay, we're not. But the reality is we're going so much faster than we were. There's so much more awareness, like the energy around it and the knowledge around it is so much greater in what I would say in construction, a very, very conservative industry in a very short period of time. So I'm like, hey, we're, we're, making, we're making some serious headway. We just need better insulation and we all set. <laughs> it, it sounds like you might have thought about this for a little bit and, and spoken on it a bit here and there. <laughs> <laughs> part of the pitch Trent that's how we do that. that's how we sell uh, the world you know like when you're going to talk about how you're making change and you need investors you really need to tell a story that yeah. makes sense and to, to be able to kind of like lean into our history and our past that, that informs why we're doing it and why we're going to be successful you know mm. is, is part of that how uh completely off subject a little bit but how how personally scary has it been having to do pitches behind such a big idea and to say, all right, I've got these people who hold fast purse strings and I've got to go to a pitch now that, oh man, I'd have such nerves. Like, is it just something you have the passion for? And it's, it's not, it's not an issue. It's like, oh, I can't, this is just going to jump out of me anyways. Or is it like, uh, is there any performance anxiety there? What a great question. You know, I just want to say, first of all, we have an amazing team. It's like this whole thing is so much, so much bigger than myself, whether it's the Timber HP, the GoLab thing or the Opal thing, like everything that I'm involved with is so much more than just me as a person. I always feel like my piece is to help collect, you know, all this sort of information, ideas and concepts that we have from all our people in our team and kind of like present them and, you know, bring them out. Um, mm -hmm. so that, that's kind of one of my, that's kind of what my job is in, in many ways. And I have so many great people supporting what we're doing that it's, it's empowering. It's, it's just feels so great to have this positive message, this, the solution. So on one level, um, you know, no, I really don't have the performance anxiety. There's some, there's some heavy hitters out there for sure though, where, yeah, you, you know, you definitely want to bring your best and most concise um, information and presentation um, for sure. But I think ultimately the way I see it now, which is different than when we began, because when we began, you kind of like have this very fragile little thing that you're trying to piece together and build and understand. And there's a lot of holes and, you know, you just keep pushing and, and trying to fill, fill the holes and like develop it. And, you know, it's a lot of work um, and there's a lot of like things that you haven't thought of and things that are unresolved and it's easy to sort of pick those apart. So earlier on, it'd be like you learn a ton all the time. Every pitch, you go to these exceptionally smart, successful people and they would just give you all this information, which made you better. You know, you, it was this great opportunity to learn and they might not invest or they might not invest in that round, but all of a sudden you had the, the benefit of their wisdom. So rather than saying like, I have this thing to protect, I'm like, I have this thing to share and part of that sharing is to understand how I can do it better. And I think that's part of that team thing is like, even if they're not an investor, I learned something from them that goes back into the project as a team will build it and develop it. Nowadays, I feel like I'm, I just think, well, I'm, you know, I think it's great. The amount of work that we've done and what we've achieved, I'm, you know, I'm proud of, of course, but I feel like, you know, this is this important solution. You know, it's this really important opportunity that we're trying to translate, not for myself. It's not it's not me. It's we need these solutions. We need demonstration of positive, scalable, massive solutions where we can solve these difficult problems, you know, kind of in, in, in one way and that have these synergies. So for me, it's like I'm just really excited to say, look, this is what we've accomplished and this is how it's important and brings value and, and is a catalyst for positive change. That's super empowering. You know, that's really gives you energy to go into a difficult conversation and say, look, I, I think we've got something that's of value here. You know, it, it, uh, it seems starting out that you did not look at it as a business opportunity as much as you saw 
a truth that you couldn't look away from, that you saw that the, the materials going into the buildings that you were attempting to make a better future with by design, uh, you were still kind of hamstrung in using these materials that put you behind of where you wanted yeah. to go. But you couldn't look away from the truth that these materials, they could be far better. And mm -hmm. it, 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 uh, it's just who you are, though. Like, well, I'll make them. <laughs> and I'll see where I can get all the materials from, and I'll just do that. That's... <laughs> yeah. That is... Uh, for, for someone like myself, who um, I operate primarily as a sole entity outside of, like, the people who directly really support me, like my wife and my studio manager. Like, I don't manage people. I can't do that. I don't assemble a team. I'm not a good translator of vision and I'm not a leader like that. And I, I don't have, I have vision for like stuff like that as a single person, but to think I've got to collect all these people, create this vision and make that happen. That to me, just my mind explodes and I, you know, I crawl back into bed, but that, uh, <laughs> to see, to see the, um, to see the response to a truth that you couldn't look away from is that's inspiring. That's like, a a moral inspiration to me to, to see mm -hmm. someone like this could be better and benefit all of us. I'm going to do this. That's, uh, mm -hmm. for where I've come to my own personal philosophy that I believe that our purpose is to each of us is to create. And I think every single person is creative. It just is in their specific realm that they are creative. Like my wife's very creative, uh, in a storyline kind of thing, not visually. You you mm -hmm. commonly think of create creativeness, you know, like canvas and paint. There's a creative person, but it's, you know, I think vastly different than that. And I think that we all are creative in a way where we are processing the information that we have natural ability towards, that we can go into that chaos and come out of that chaos, establishing some order that is beneficial to the the established order that we then present it to and it, and it moves on it and it builds. And in your creativity with design, but also seeing this moral truth that's affecting all of us and the planet and everything else, you've, you've created this new thing out of that and are, and are working at your own risk and peril that any business venture is in, in pushing that forward. And it's, it, it to me, it's, if I were you, I'd have, I'd sleep so much better at night knowing I'm not just making luxury items for, you know, people who can afford to, to have a house, you know, that looks nicer than a tract home in, in some sub development. I'm in doing, it's kind of like F1 racing. You're like developing really, really, uh, applicable technology that goes into race cars that also applies to the rest of the auto industry. You know, mm -hmm. and that's, mm -hmm. that's pretty, that's pretty interesting to see. Um, and I'm, I'm, I've always been impressed in my interactions with you to just see the mind, but also the response to that, uh, to take that drive and to turn it into something that is benefiting the overall. It's, that's just really cool. Kudos to you. Um, the, well, you know, I just, I, I appreciate you saying that, but there's one piece that I have to be like, I want to be clear about too, um, in all this. And, and that's the business side of it because it is, it is this drive to do better, right? And, and find solutions and bring them to the marketplace, whether it's passive house, you know, in our role that we played or in this case, the insulation. But I, you know, I think part of it always has been too that, you know, we're a very market driven society and culture and we have to be viable in the marketplace and part of it's the idea of exchange of ideas and you know the role that you play with the imagery and and just communicating those i think you do so well um, and has benefited us in communicating ideas that this type of construction and living can be better and beautiful and wonderful and you know it's visible it's you know it's you can access that and i think for us like with passive house we've always believed strongly that the, you have to be cost competitive as well. Like you can't just like do a sustainable thing over in your corner and say, I'm doing the right thing without uh, paying attention to the market because the market will leave you behind or you won't scale. And I think with like passive house, it was always first cost advantage. So improve the building envelope, reduce the mechanical systems costs and come out, 
is, you know, close on a first cost basis. And that's, you know, that's, that helped us grow, you know, that helped us diversify. And I think with the, the insulation and the, and the, uh, what we're doing there is it was, I need the solution for my buildings. Um, but also there's this huge opportunity on the business side. And that was part of, you know, again, you know, GoLab is so much Josh Henry and the team, you know, that I just want to, I can't say that enough. It's, it's really these incredible people that have done this together. But there's this early business model that Josh built where we realized that the insulation industry is driven by fossil fuel costs and energy, right? That's, that's what pegs those because they are either foam, foam is basically oil derived plastic product or, you know, it's, has a high carbon footprint. And we were talking about using wood as the raw material and very little energy. So we have these really low cost inputs, which means we can be very cost competitive with the standard, you know, mass market insulations with really good returns. You know, there's a really good margin in that because our price structure is down here and we're competing at a price structure up there. And part of it was to say, this is also good business. You know, this is also a good business opportunity that we have to take this risk on as well. Not just I need this insulation, but there's these synergies around a new product, a new idea and a business model. So I, I don't want to be I do things, I think, for trying to do the right thing. You know, I'm committed to that. But there's also like a business side, which means we have to be very practical and pragmatic for for change to occur in play by the rules of the market. And, and that's something I fundamentally believe in as well, not because I want to do it that way, but that's just a reality of how we have to operate, you know? Well, I think, I think it speaks to the, uh, I think the, the best societal structure, a, a capitalist society, while well, it has tons of problems, I get it, but if someone sees a truth that they want to pursue, there's not this singular central control spread throughout society that would prevent you from kind of going outside the lines and taking a risk and, and doing something incredibly well, responding to a truth that you see and then being rewarded for it. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, while, it, while we have our problems as a nation and as a, as a way of organizing our society, it's still, to me, is is the best fit for the human condition and and flourishing and i think you know it's a you you, you take a risk and you know you benefit from it you, you might go down in flames but i don't think you're gonna <laughs> go down in flames so you know so let's hope not um so you and i have uh a similar of uh, you know pretty much exact i would say i i all the stuff i see you design and that you surround yourself with i'm like huh that's really nice. <laughs> um, the design aesthetic, where for you, where did that come from? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think living in Maine is the kind of we're in Belfast area, which is mid coast, kind of rural. You know, there's just incredible Portland North cultural landscape. Portland North, exactly. There's incredible I'm in cultural Portland landscape. South. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like the equator, it's above or below. Right. Um, um, yeah, and I think for us, there's like this beautiful landscape, which has these like really simple relationships with this incredible, you know, natural environment with these really simple structures, really simply articulated. They're very modest and they were there because they were built that way for reasons that had to do with survival and in its most kind of simple sense with local materials and that that austerity of those relationships, I absolutely love. I just think it's so beautiful. I'm just, I'm just constantly inspired by how great these, you know, traditional buildings are in this environment and what this kind of interesting cultural fit is. And, you know, Maine isn't the only place that has, has this sort of, sort of very simple set of relationships. You know, you see it in Scandinavia and in these other places. It's just this, this sort of engagement with nature but also juxtaposed kind of with the clarity of, of these volumetric responses. It's not trying to imitate, it's its own thing. And I think for us, there's always been this kind of love of that lands the cultural landscape that we live in, which drives this sort of minimalism in our architectural thinking, which has to do with emulating these very simple, austere sets of relationships. Now, what I don't necessarily engage with is like the inside of a cape, which can have low ceilings and small rooms and all this thick trim and tiny windows. Like that to me is not the beautiful part. It's really more this sort of object in the landscape. So I think what we've done is take 
you know, taking our experience of architecture elsewhere, you know, trained, I me, mean, I was trained in Europe um, and the other team have been, you know, trained in other, you know, kind of modern schools around the country and then start to integrate those ideas of interesting spatial relationships and openness and glazing and um, to create this interior experience, which is very different than the traditional Cape, but informed by this really sort of minimalist and sort of site building response. So I think a lot of it is just kind of loving the simplicity of those gestures and really from a design standpoint, not embellishing or decorating, but allowing it to be about form, language, light and material. And just sort of this very simple set of relationships that I find extremely beautiful and, and from a practice standpoint are really difficult to achieve. Like minimal is so much more difficult than sort of additive architecture because the one detail has to really solve every condition. It just has to come together. And that, that precision and discipline is something that from a design standpoint, I think in the firm, we, we really engage with, we love, you know, it's just, it just keeps us going and like how we can kind of take that and in, into new forms and ideas and different scale buildings and so forth. Now, why, why, why don't you identify with and pull from, uh, the things that have been established already as being good? Why do you design in a more modern, um, and creative, a new creative aesthetic, if you will. Why, why do you push in that direction rather than a more traditional, uh, from a bin of parts that's been proven to be mm. successful? Like what I is it in you that drives you to do that? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I guess I'm not really interested in replicating that much. You know, it's really about kind of coming up with a language which is, which is a bit more authentic. Um, and, you know, kind of specific to the conditions. And I think the more you replicate in terms of detailing and, and this sort of more standard, uh, probably kit of parts or language, I, I just feel like to me that loses its authenticity because it is just a replication. I mean, it's not like the thing is new or, or you're not like you bought it that way, you know, and it's just pure this way. It's, it's, it's been replicated. It's a molding machine replicating something that some guy did with a scribe, you know, way back when it's, it's just manufactured, you know, so to me, it's like, let's look at the opportunity of the technology of windows and, and these sort of different construction systems and allow them to become this informing, evolving, developing language of expression and how we live in sustainable, comfortable, you know, kind of buildings. So I guess it really has to do with, I don't like repeating. I don't like, I don't, I like, I like the authentic response or what we're, I guess we're defining as authentic response, mm -hmm. you know? That, that's always been, um, because in architecture school, I had a professor that was a, an extreme classicist, I think is what I would call him. Um, and then I had one that was, uh, you know, arts and crafts, timber frame was the only thing worth doing, you know. And then I mm -hmm. had this, <laughs> this, you know, wild and crazy ostracized from the rest of the uh, professors, uh, Arpod, Arpod Ronasegi, who was, I think, part German, part Hungarian or something, um, who was wildly fascinated with the creativity and the ability to do all of these different and new things. Like he, he would constantly bring in Renzo Piano Buildings, uh, IMP, you know. And, and just be so passionate about these new expressions of, of ways to create spaces and ways of joining things together that was just, uh, you know, as a, as a young person looking at the potential, it was intoxicating to see someone's passion in this uh, ultimately very, very creative way. I mean, he was at the time, you know, this is 21 years ago, he was taking photoshop and making presentations for you know different things he wanted to do and different ways of designing that you could only really do by combining at the time combining photoshop with sketching and kind mm -hmm. of intermingling those and doing these weird things and it, it was always really inspiring for me to see someone who was going out into the unestablished you know and and seeing what they could do with it and bringing it back and trying to make something out of it that you know, the, the things like, uh, the go home, the things like my home, 
um, which, you know, kind of looks like a go home. <laughs> um, <laughs> in, in 15 or 20 years, you know, they'll look like they're from this time, but then in another 15 or 20 years, they, they might be timeless, you know, mm -hmm. but you mm -hmm. never really, you never really know until like 50 years out. Um, but when, when done in such a respectful way, pulling from the uh, vernacular architecture of the area mm -hmm. to, to make these parts and to keep the forms, but just, it's kind of like how they do with the Porsche 911 every year. It's like, did they mm. really change it? Oh yeah, no way, they did, <laughs> look at that, you know? Every year, it's just, it's, it's new and it's beautiful and it's just slightly different. And if you, every year you go back, there's never a huge crazy change, but you look at the first one and the last one, they're light years apart, but you can tell mm -hmm. every single one in the process, you know, and mm -hmm. that's what was, it's just that process, that, uh, that attraction and desire to go into the unknown and see what you can create new to add to it rather than do the safe thing. It, it comes back to this idea of creativity and everyone's creative in different ways. And it makes me wonder why this one professor was so fascinated with repeating classic architecture or this other stuff like why were they fascinated with that and this other uh designer mm -hmm. so fascinated with this other other way of doing it and i look at my own ability to interact with people we just built a barn and i did not rely on doing uh that barn creatively in the way i interacted with the people building it i designed what i wanted i roughly sketched it out did a horrible job as far as sketching enough to actually get what i wanted but that's on me um but i wanted an exact contract and no one went outside of this you know it was all zip i did not want to be creative <laughs> with that relationship and mm -hmm. it went wrong and the people building that barn were really frustrated with me because I was like, no, he has a contract, you know, and <laughs> there's this like, what do you want me to build a cabinet? Here? You know, and the contract wasn't clear enough because I was, I was relying on something that wasn't done well as far as a contract, but also I was out of my comfort zone in a mm. personal relationship. I wanted extreme contract because I'm not skilled there. So I had to bring mm. my wife in who's incredibly creative and talented with relationships and she was able to come in and manage that relationship with you know uh, going into this chaos and she established order through her creativeness of relationship and got the whole thing executed and finished and done well and it to me to look at the different personalities involved in all of that compared to these professors who like why is this one getting stuck on classicism and why do i think i'm creative but then i can't handle a relationship in a creative manner to get something done. But someone who I view as not creative, my wife is actually creative and can come in and just, you know, flow in that. And it's that idea mm. of creativity. I've, I've worked with it enough to where I'm starting to see that every single person has their call to creativity, what they see and where they can see truth and how they can work with it to either manipulate to their own advantage simply or to work with it to, give something back that is uh, something that adds to the overall. And that's, that's what I see with what you're doing, not just with your design, but with the, the insulation products and everything else that I think is so incredibly cool to, to, yeah, to have that, that coming in. That's, you know, that's such a good way of explaining the way I see, like your, your story is how I see the world. Like there's this book um, called Who, Who Not How, um, it's all about finding people to solve problems. Like if you, if you want to do something, it's not a how, how do you solve the problem? It's who do you get to solve the problem? Because it's all about what we do individually well, like our own creativity. I think that's a really good way that you've said it, but that has its limits. And there's areas where other people's creativity is actually where the solution comes from, like when bringing your wife in, which I think is an awesome mm -hmm. story. Um, and that's that's exactly how I see everything in my world is sort of like I have this sort of limited set of skills that I do and I have these ideas and kind of a lot of drive and passion to like push along and articulate. But there's all these other incredibly talented people who are actually the solution to the problem. And to me, once I figured that out, life became so much more interesting and exciting because it was just like a constant dialogue of opportunity. 
and and sharing this sort of experience of these these challenges with others and, and bringing them to help solve it. And so that you know, I think I love that I love that concept because it is it's the individual creativity of each of those people, which is their brilliance and and why things can can go forward at scale. And that's just I think that's so empowering myself. Yeah, we we I start to see us as uh, really really advanced ants. You kind of feel like you're <laughs> you're such a you're such an individual. You're so incredibly singularly special and no one's like you but then you you pull out to this wide view and you look at an ant and you're like looking at that one little ant you're like why do you keep doing this why don't you go have freedom and do what you're supposed to do but you realize that you know those ants each play a role and outside of functioning within that anthill they mean nothing and they will die and they'll Mm -hmm. and it's the combination of you know we're you know we're highly highly complex obviously ants that all have these different uh, avenues of creativity that we, we bring to the table to solve these different problems. And for any one of us to think that, you know, we're skilled enough to solve, you know, anything to think, how do we solve anything? It's more so who, you know, who solves this? And that's, that's a, that's a good insight. Um, talk to me about yourself. Why have you been successful? You're one of these people in my, you know, professional life that I keep rubbing up against. And it's like, geez, Matt's active. He's, he's doing stuff. <laughs> have, have you thought about why me? Why, why, why have I been this person who's been able to make a business in a state that's hard to make a business in? Why have I been successful at it? And why have I, why am I doing this thing that's putting me, you know, potentially on a very national level of recognition for for doing these kinds of things like why you not that you don't you, deserve you, it but i'm saying you do <laughs> um i actually don't like to talk about myself that much um you know like that's for me that's a really tough question yeah no that could be part of it I, you know it's it's a difficult question for me about why because i don't see it at all in that way you know i I think for me, if I have, if I have a gift, it's to understand the value of others, kind of the, the who question. Like I, I think one of my skills is that I see what other people can do and bring and collaborate. And I respect that. And that's how I think of the world is just a series of relationships with people and opportunities. Like that's how I, I think I get things done. Um, and I think for me personally, you know, I, I, I just think there's, there's these opportunities for change, right? That, that just become quite like, to me, they're like, it's so clear. It's so obvious there, you know, we have to change the way we're doing. Like, look, you know, look at the facts on the ground. We need to res- respect data and f- information and respond accordingly. And, and in my business, I'm, I'm an architect, you know, I'm totally an architect when I'm doing the go lab timber HP stuff. I'm an architect within this manufacturing startup and that I'm still an architect. Like I still have my core skill set, which is to say, I'm trying to solve these bigger problems and buildings fortunately has this fortunately or unfortunately has this massive intertwined relationship to the environment and society and everything around us. And to play a role is in, in being an architect is to have this sort of outsized impact on that. Right. You know, like, going to work every day, drawing a line on the paper about how a wall assembly is going to be or a relationship in the city is going to be, that is going to be translated into the physical form and impact either city or environment for years and years to come. And to me, it's like a very daunting concept that that's our role as architects, that's our our responsibility. Because when you think of the number, did I put enough layers of insulation in this building for 50 years from now? Because it's going to be existing in 50 years from now. And if I'm just thinking about today and my own needs and like, I just want to get this done or it's too much pressure or whatever, and I'm putting in motion these things, that's going to have impact all of us and our children. Whew. You know, like that's a lot already, you know, to think about. And for me, it's sort of like, that's my job as an architect. And I'm taking that that line on the paper is really, really seriously. And from that has come 
I've got to improve the way we collaborate in construction. I have to, th we have to think differently about what building performance should be. We have to collaborate differently with our mechanical and structural teams so that we can achieve that. Oh, by the way, we have a problem with insulation. I'm going to collaborate with a chemist now. He's a brilliant guy and take a flyer and try and make something much larger, but is a real solution that we need. So it's really just like, you know, I'm busy drawing my lines on the paper on a daily basis. Like, you know, I'm all about my knitting, so to speak. And out of that comes solutions that I just can't not act on when I, you know, when you see this opportunity, it's like, holy crap, this is amazing. Think of what happens when we do this. Think of the transformational opportunity. And the, our, like our latest one right now is now that we're going to be producing wood fiber insulation in Madison, it has this really great, you know, as you've seen, it, it's like the solid composite in the board form. And what we want to do is then start to laminate that with CLT blanks. And then you do CNC and actually cut the building shell out of these full composites. So it's a full building envelope that nobody touches. Like it's fully automated with fully recyclable, sustainable materials. All the offcuts go get recycled and get made into insulation again with zero waste stream, you know? So it's like all of a sudden we can take insulation, which is fully recyclable. That's the breakthrough actually. It's really the, that it's fully recyclable is our breakthrough and combine it with solid mass construction, which is fully cuttable and, you know, sort of robust. And you can see and see it into the building shape without all the headers and details and jack studs and, clips and all this other stuff, combine that into one routed out, printed out, whatever, and you have a, an entire building envelope that can be installed extremely quickly with so little labor and with such high precision. Trent, that is amazing what we can do with that at scale. And so what are we doing? Well, we're also starting <laughs> to... <laughs> Do these composite panels. We're going to be installing, installing a, a school here in Belfast that I'm going to need you to photograph coming up in June as we put it together where we're taking the one on your pre website pre at the beginning. Uh, no. Oh, it's, it shows that that's a, that's a little build. Yeah, no, but it's, um, it's an, it's another project that we haven't even, it's not even available, but we're, we're doing this full composite thing in Madison where we're making these panels, installing windows and installing it as a fully insulated building envelope in a matter of days like, uh, sips panels but with the wooden with the wood fiber. yeah with a clt structure and then the wood fiber and the wood fiber is cool because you don't need and it can be exposed to the weather during construction it doesn't need a wrb on it it's really durable it's an amazing material and then you, you just put the siding over it so you know like this is an example like all of a sudden we're like we need insulation and we really understood what insulation does and it's this like beautiful recyclable material not to mention all the other, other attributes. And then we can combine it with another material and have a fully recyclable composite with zero waste in the, in the manufacturing stream that can be scalable, you know, for multifamily and whatever. So it's like the opportunities for me, it's just like the kind of a problem actually, because my wife's like, oh, oh, uh oh, not another business, please. I'm like, no, honey, it's not a real business. It's just an idea. It's just an idea. <laughs> And so then all of a sudden we're like, oh, but we should, you know, make that a business really. That should be a business. Who's going to do that for me? Who's gonna, who am I going to get who will be, have the skills to help me do this? And that's what we're doing now. And that's how it works with me. You know, what's my special sauce? It's like, I don't, I don't want to talk about myself, but I just see these opportunities that come out of the work that I'm doing and the problems I'm trying to solve. And, and, and it just, that's what it is. And then, then you can translate that into an architectural language like we did with the passive house a little bit, you know, and it just kind of loops and cycles. It's just really exciting. And not to mention, we have just such a talented team to jump in and take these risks with me. So, so I get this straight that you guys are now also doing, uh, producing a product similar to SIPS panels that is, uh, that is, uh, CLT with the, uh, the rigid insulation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from the wood fiber and then another uh, CLT, or is it just the kind of essentially plywood and then the insulation on the outside? Yeah, it'll be, so CLT, uh, wood fiber, rigid board, and then OSB actually on the outside layer. So it's a sandwich, it's like a SIPS, it is, but instead of having the SIP be two layers of OSB, it has a CLT, which gives it a little more scalability and strength and different ways of we can build with it so 
And it's the CLT is structural, you know, fully structural. So they can be ceiling panels. It can be the roofs, you know, the floor system. You know, it's like this very primitive way of building. I mean, you saw the the one project we did in Connecticut go together. It was just like zip, 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 that beautiful video that you took. Um, you know, and it's just like once we did that project and the precision of that project and like the scale and the speed that we could assemble. After that, I was like, wait a minute wait a minute, we're not thinking about this correctly. We, you know, we should think about how we can make this full composite and install that, you know? And so that now we're doing- now we're You've doing. advanced the process and product even from that place that we had done the video for you on the lake in Connecticut. Yeah, 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 exactly. You should come up to the mill. It's, uh, it's gonna be exciting summer. Uh, summer. I'd, I'd love to. Um, I'm, I'm thinking we had talked about uh, filming or, you know, documenting that mill to some degree. And I just met a guy at the, I took my kids to the skate park the other day and he was flying one of these racing drones and he does it commercially <clears throat> as well. Cause we're about to shoot the, uh, the children's museum there in Portland. And I was, this guy was doing incredible acrobatics with this drone. And I don't know if you've seen him do stuff like this before, but I mean, it's, kind of mind-blowing i've got a drone but i just put it in a place and i take a picture this guy could could literally go through a building at a fairly high rate of speed and create a lot of when you combine it with editing and everything else you can really get a, a neat take on things um in, in a very quick manner but side thought that that i could get off on the uh on the wrong foot for quite a long time there so anyways <laughs> um to to round this out, I imagine you've got a lot of stuff to do today, so I won't take too much of your time. But um, to I, I really, I really appreciate your answer as to why are you so successful. Well, it's I've looked for the people who are talented to 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 do the things that that we need done. It's it's not how do I solve this? Who can I get that's talented this solve this? It's the people you surround yourself with, and there's. There's a there's a confidence, there's a grace, uh, and there's a lot of wisdom in that approach. And when I look at, because I because I kind of lay lay awake at night at times wondering like, when is when is this ruse going to end, and it's all going to come crashing down for me? Like I, <laughs> there's what they call imposter syndrome, where you you become, you know, established or good at something and you, you constantly sit with this idea of like, I hope no one figures out that I don't know what I'm doing and I, I shouldn't be in this position, you know, but then mm -hmm. I start to mm -hmm. look at, um, you know, my, for one, my own, my own efforts and my own propensity to like make a to-do list every single day. But also like you're saying, you know, you have a lot of supportive, good people around yourself, Trent, that, that have helped you put you in this place and you, you owe the people around you so much um, for for where you're at, and I I think just hearing your answer makes me makes me think about that more. And I appreciate that. Um, but to round it out with something uh, just kind of silly, uh, you inherit twenty million. How does your life change in the next month? <laughs> well, I'm done with finance. I, I put it. You meant out of it. <laughs> I, I finish our I finish our Series A round and I don't have to worry about financing anymore. So that would be the very honest truth. No, I think uh, for me, you know, I I do a lot. I mean, I work a lot. Um, you know, with the many many projects that are underway. But I think for me, it's to provide just a little more balance. You know, I've been running at a pretty high clip because of the scale of the project and the pandemic. As we kind of started this conversation with that quite honestly, didn't help at all, um, making my life any less stressful. Um, but coming around on the other side of it, I think for me, it's about having the flexibility to take a little more time. I love to run, I'm a, you know, I love to trail run. Uh, I love to travel and pandemic kind of cuts into the traveling part, but it's good for trail running. But I, I just think it would be to have a little uh, more time to spend doing that family travel, you know, and just kind of getting out there and, and seeing the world. Cause I do, it's just such a fascinating place. Um, this, this world we're in and it, it'd be the opportunity to have more time to enjoy it thoroughly, you know, no, nothing big. <laughs> There's a psychological term called a uh, zone of proximal development. And it's when, if you, if you were to draw a line around order that, 
you know, is established order and then you have chaos and, you know, the unknown outside of that. There's, there's a place outside of that order that a person can exist and still be functional. Some people are highly open. And, and again, I, I believe that this applies to any part of life. So in general, some people can exist pretty far outside of that um, established realm of order, but they always have to come back in to, to the order to, to rejuvenate themselves, whatever, to be able to go back out into that chaos, to, to look into the abyss of you know, our lack of understanding of all these things that are to pull back into order something that is worth being a brick to, you know, build that established order bigger. Um, and it, it's interesting that uh, when when I propose you've got $20 million, you don't have to do anything. Your response is that I'm going to come back from the chaos a little bit so I can go back <laughs> out more. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back into the order. I'm gonna run a bit. I'm gonna spend some time with my family. So, it it uh, you know I, I center myself with my purpose and everything else immediately. But it gives me something to go back out into that chaos and establish more order. Which is that's a that's a we're we're just gonna call you a design warrior and, and business model. <laughs> Well, uh, I don't know. That's great. That's really great. That's funny because um, if you <laughs> if you ask my wife, we talk about this a lot, and she's like, "You, yes, you say that, but you'll just start something new." And I was like, "No, I, I promise, I won't." And she's like, no, "I know can, you. Can you, will. you. You imagine will. retirement, though." I no. I mean, I'd be horrible I, to live around. I know. No, I just think again. I think there's just so many cool opportunities and things that can develop and change. And not and to sit on the sidelines while that happens, it doesn't matter like what my income is. It's like it's just the opportunity to kind of be part of that conversation. It's just so interesting. You know, it's just so for me, that's where the energy comes from. I just absolutely love it. You know, I love it. Well, that's a great way to end this. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Uh, and I've I've really, really enjoyed uh, working with anything you guys have been doing over the past 12, 15, 20 years, however long it's been. Um, it's, it's really, really been neat to watch the trajectory of, of uh, all the younger firms that I started working with that are now established and doing well. And I could have told you when I started out with each one of those firms that is, you know, now doing well and successful that each one of them would have been successful and you're obviously one of them. It's it's uh, it's been really neat to see. I think we have some really amazing design talent in Maine, and we've got some really forward thinkers and cutting edge things going on here, which is just, I think, really great for the state. And I think people who are highly creative uh, find an an open, welcoming canvas in Maine, even though it yeah. it might yeah. not have money just flowing around everywhere. There's a spirit here, an attitude. That is, uh, you know, we we've got to get this done because winter's coming anyways. So let's <laughs> let's you know let's make it pretty and yeah. There's there's a frontier combined with design aesthetic. Something going on here that that I'm really happy to be a part of. So yeah, you know, I, I see it exactly the same way. I just you know since we've started working with you the whole time and your development, the other firms, just the level and quality of design that is present in the state that the sort of exploration i think is fantastic and it you know you look around it's just a rarity i mean maine has has kind of come into something i think that i'm excited to play a, a tiny role in i think you've been pivotal because part of it has been this communication to the outside world we we can build these great buildings but without translating that the, the kind of the the beauty of these things to the outside world we have nothing actually as architects and I think, you know, that has been so much of our collective success is this dialogue amongst these creative folks. And I think we've been hitting on that theme in this um, chat for a bit. And I just think you're right. I just think there's been something here where people have tried to do the right things and, and made the sacrifices to be in a state that doesn't have the resources, but seen those as opportunities and catalysts. And I think when that happens, cool stuff happens. And, and I think, there, you know, outside of Maine, I think, people read that it's legible and they're like, I want that authenticity 
of what is going on in this state in terms of design and living. And it's not just the architecture. I think there's that whole food piece that's going on and food production. And just like, there's a real kind of, I think an authenticity, I already said that, but I, I think what's nice about it is that it's kind of developed out of the kind of texture and character of the state itself, which I think is something cool, you know? It doesn't feel applied or, or imported or any of that. It just is, it just kind of grows and develops. And I'm inspired by it. I mean, that's, I think that's what's cool is the work of the other architects, you know, our peers um, to see what they're doing and, and kind of like the forward momentum uh, you know, that helps us kind of get excited and keep going as well. So really good stuff. Mm. Well, uh, congratulations and good luck on, on further, further endeavors. Hopefully not too many more endeavors, lest your wife get too upset with you there. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Well, I look forward to seeing you. We have some, uh, some shoots coming up, so that'll be great fun to, to connect and I look forward to that. Cool. Always, always a pleasure uh, interacting with you guys and, and speaking with you. Thanks again for your time and uh, take care. All right. Bye, Trent.